everyone, I'm Abigail. This is James, and welcome to another Two Kids interview. We are joined by Newberry Honor and New York, New York Times bestselling author Jennifer Choldenko. Ms. Choldenko has written many, many books, including Orphan Eleven, Dad and the Dinosaur, One Third Nerd, Chasing Secrets, No Passengers Beyond the, This Point. The New York Times best-selling book, Dogtown. And, of course, The Tale from Alcatraz books, which include the Newberry Honor book, Al Capone, Does My Shirts. Thank you so much for being with us today. Honored. What fun. Your most recent book, Dogtown, has spent a lot of October and November on the New York Times bestseller list. All of your other books you wrote by yourself. Dogtown, you're, you're, you co-authored with another amazing author, Catherine Applegate. How did that happen, and how did that change your writing process? Uh, well, um, I, I have to say that on Wednesday, my editor emails um, to say whether the, uh, the book is on the bestseller list this week. And it, I just got an email that said it's on the bestseller list. So <laughs> that's pretty exciting. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it was very different. I, I think I would not have um, liked co-authoring a book when I first started writing uh, because I, I want to do everything myself. But I've written now lots of books. And so it was so fun to get to share in the process, to come up with an idea and be able to email um, Catherine and have her respond, um, to uh, have someone to bounce ideas off of, to get to a point in the manuscript where I say, I'm not sure what happens here, and send it to her. We, used to, we sometimes use the phrase, tag your it, and we give the, <laughs> the, the manuscript to each other. Um, so. It's been really fun. And uh, I don't know that I could have co-authored with just anyone, um, but Catherine is, um, first of all, we think very similarly and we have similar senses of humor. So we uh, didn't have a lot of arguments. I mean, occasionally we did, but not a lot of them. Uh, and um, also she's really a kind and authentic person. So, um, you know, I I never there was never any competition or anything like that. One third nerd includes a character with special needs. Izzy has Down syndrome. Syndrome. What inspired your writing? Your you writing Izzy? Uh, well, um, my sister had um autism when I uh, she actually died when I was um, fifteen, but um. She, Having a, a sister with special needs made a huge impression on me. And that's why I included in uh, the Tales from Alcatraz series uh, uh, a, a character uh, who was on the spectrum. Um, but I wanted, I've been interested in Down syndrome because a friend of mine has a child with Down syndrome. And so um, it's just, my fascination with it made me want to write a character with Down syndrome. And so I went and I interviewed um, families that had um, a, a family member that had Down syndrome. And that was really interesting um, because it seemed like a, a very different kind of dynamic than a family with a, a child on the spectrum. Can you tell us about the research that went into your, your Al Capone books? Yeah, um, well, there are four of them, and I wrote them over, you know, a long period. Um, the first one, uh, what I did was, <coughs> excuse me a second, I worked on the island as a volunteer uh, one day a week, and um, that gave me access to, first of all, I would come to the island during different seasons, during different weather conditions, and so I, I got to feel what it was like to be there. I take the boat across and the whole, there's there's sort of a whole production to being on Alcatraz. Uh, but also I got to meet people who um, had written books about Alcatraz and they would come through and sign their book. And they were, you know, people who had grown up on Alcatraz. There were guards um, who had worked on Alcatraz. There were prisoners who had been convicts on Alcatraz. 
So whenever I had a question, I could actually go directly to the source and ask them, you know, what was this like? What was that like? Also, it gave me access to a, a hole in the wall library they have on Alcatraz that had a lot of un published stuff, not, you know, just notes and notebooks and interviews. So I got a lot of information and that really helps in writing a book. The more interesting information that you have, the easier it is to write. Book is a big commitment. When you get an idea, how do you become sure that that is the, the idea you want to commit to and write? What a great question that is. Um, one of the things that I've learned from working with Catherine Applegate is that the most important thing is the idea, the initial book idea. And I tend to love being in the middle of a book. So I get an idea and there I'm gone for, you know, two years, three years. <laughs> Sometimes it takes to write it. But she is much more discriminating about what book, uh, what book idea to go after. Um so I'm, I'm learning to kind of sit with the discomfort of not knowing what I'm going to do next. Um, I'm like the Energizer Bunny. I love working on stuff. So it's hard. It's hard to just sit with not knowing what to do next and be, um, as I said, more discriminating about which idea to choose. But I think the ideas that I end up following, because you kind of follow an idea to a book are ideas that I can't turn away from, you know, that just kind of haunt me, that, you know, wake me up and, it, you know, I think, oh, that's not a good idea, but it just keeps coming back and keeps coming back. Um, and then I think, oh, you know what? I'm going to have to write a book about that. When you were writing a character, can you tell us some, some of the questions you ask yourself about the character? <laughs> oh, that's another good question. Some of the questions I ask myself, well, I have a, a basically two ways of working on character. Sometimes the character is just there on the page. It just pops on the page. And then I'm just trying to figure out who they are, but they, they feel fully formed. So I don't need to do all, all the background so much because I know who they are in some kind of weird intrinsic way. And then there's another kind of character. I don't know who they are. And for that kind of character, I have to ask a lot of questions. Um, and the kinds of questions I ask are, you know, what are your secrets? Uh, what's in your closet? Uh, um, what do you tell people? Uh, you know, what might you lie about, about yourself? You know, what are you ashamed of? Um, what do you do when no one is looking? Um, because I wanted to really know who a character is inside, not just how they present to the world. Rejection is a part of most writers' story. Can you tell us about that part of your journey? Yeah. Um, well, for me, the re most of the rejection um, happened after I wrote my first book, before I got my second book published. <laughs> my first book, I'll show you what it is here. This is my first book, and it was a picture book. And I, I went, I was going to art school. And so I kind of illustrated it. Um, and that, even though they didn't buy the illustrations, I think the illustrations helped sell the book. And that I sold without a problem. And it did pretty well. Um, so usually if you sell a book and it does pretty well, then you're kind of home free. But that didn't happen with me. I could not sell a second book to save my soul. And I wrote book, picture book after picture book after picture book. And then I wrote a couple of novels. And I think that I am actually more of a novelist than a picture book writer. But becoming a novelist took time, a, a longer time than I thought it would. So there was a real maturing process that I had to go through. Um, so between when this book got, um, well, let's see between when it got accepted and my first novel, which was my second book to be published, got accepted seven years. So that was a lot of rejection. Um, but I I just kept at it. I mean, seven years is more than half of your, your life, you guys. Um, but, you know, when you really are something and want something, it, you know, you just keep at it. I'm actually really grateful to the person I was then that I didn't give up because if I had given up, then I wouldn't have this incredible career. 
We have interviewed a number of authors who've had books banned in certain places. That means in those places, kids don't have the same access to the books that we may have and may not be able to see themselves represented in books. Can you give us your feelings on this? Yeah, it's. I think it's a really scary time uh, with the book banning. And um, Al Capone does my shirts. Let's see. Has been banned. So I understand um, what that feels like. Uh, and it is extremely upsetting. And the people that lose are the kids, as you said in your question, because they don't see themselves in, in the books. And it's really important to see yourself in a book because um, one of the ways that you understand yourself is by identifying with uh, fictional characters in a book. And if you don't see someone that looks like you or feels like you or seems like you, then you really get cheated. Okay. So it's the kids in those states that are really missing out. Can you tell us exactly where you were and your reaction when you found out you were a new beer new honor author? Yeah. Well, as a kid, um, I've always been very earnest, but I wasn't a really showy winning person. Um, I did a lot of, uh, I wrote a lot of, in a lot of horse shows. And I was never the one that, you know, got a blue ribbon, not never, but rarely. Um, and so I got, um, the award I got from my stable was the Good Sportsmanship Award, which is the award they give someone that, you know, is always good about not getting, a, <laughs> always has a good attitude, even if they don't do that well. Um, so that's kind of my persona. I'm pretty down to earth and I'm not, you know, I'm not a star. Um, so when, um, the Newberry was approaching, um, there were a lot of mock Newberries, which are, have nothing to do with the real Newberry process, but just groups of librarians or at schools, they put together a list of books that they liked this year. And then the kids or the librarians vote on it. And so I was getting a lot of emails that said that Al Capone does my shirts was winning the, the mock Newberries. Um, but you know, I knew that that really wasn't relevant. Um, and so I live in California. And at that point, the Newbury was in Boston. And so there's a three hour time difference. And they have to call you before they announce and they announce at like eight in the morning. So they call you like 430 in the morning. And I had heard that. So I was sleeping soundly. And um, I, I woke up and I thought I heard the phone ringing. And then I thought, wow, you have such a vivid imagination. You're even dreaming that the phone is ringing, you know, because they're going to, you know, tell you you want a new or a new bird owner. And um, so I just sat there and I didn't answer the phone because I thought I had dreamt it. And then luckily they called me back. And this time I was like, oh my God, that really is the phone ringing. <laughs> and so I jumped up and um, actually my husband got it. And he he said, you know, who's calling at this time in the morning? <laughs> and they explained who they were. And it was really mind blowing. It was mind blowing to win an award like that um, when you weren't the kind of person that wins awards. Can you tell us your thoughts and if you are at all concerned about artificial intelligence and its future impact on publishing? I don't, you know, I can't imagine that there is anyone who is not concerned about that. Um, I, I think our society is not really prepared um, for uh, AI. And so I think there's ways to regulate and control it, but we are way, the, the, the uh, dog is, the tail is wagging the dog. Um, and so it's sort of terrifying um, I went, I was uh, speaking at a book festival and um, a mom came up to me and asked me, you know, what, how much of my book was written by AI? <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? None of them is written by AI. But it was as if she just assumed that that's how I wrote my books. Um, it's also kind of disturbing to me because AI is using my books in order to learn how to write books. <laughs> so. I, I, a lot of authors are, you know, objecting to that. Um, uh, but I don't know where it's going. 
but at this point, it it, it feels very threatening. Um, and I, I feel like it, there can be good uses for AI, but um, we have to slow down the process to be able to understand what we're doing before um, we just let it go wild in our world. What author has had the most influence on you? Well, I mean, lots of authors have had influence on me, but I guess E.B. White would be um, someone who comes to mind. I think that Charlotte's Web is the best book for kids ever written. Um, it is just amazing. And every few years I reread it just to see what the high bar is. Um, because not only was it a good concept with great characters, on a granular sentence to sentence level, E.B. White reads so, so well. What advice do you have for young writers? Well, um, a couple of things. One is it's really important to read as much as you can. You know, read the things that are interesting. Follow that thread of books that are interesting to you and, and read about those. The other thing that I think is really important is to be kind to yourself. Um, when you get an idea, say, wow, that's a good idea. What else can I come up with instead of that's a stupid idea? Because if you tell yourself, you're right, this is a stupid idea, why would you ever want to come up with another idea? So I think being kind to your inner self, to your writer self, is really an important part of the process. And also just figuring out what, what's fun. I mean, if you don't think writing is fun at any point, then, you know, maybe that's not the right you know, profession for you. Because I think it's a blast. I can't wait to get back. Right now I'm revising something and I can't wait to get back to it. Sorry, we interrupted that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's just, I mean, it's just, I just really enjoy the, the process. That's big advice. Do you also have a smaller tip for, for something you do when, when you are writing? That maybe a lot of people don't. Yeah, Um. let me see. Uh. Well, uh, one thing I do is I just try and make whatever I'm working on a little better than it was the day before, you know, because sometimes when you have, you know, a 200 page or 250 page manuscript, that's, that's a big piece of work and it can be overwhelming. So I just try and make it a little better than it was the day before. That's it. And, um, and that is, seems more doable. In June of 2024, you have you have a book, the te the tenth mistake of Hank Hooperman, coming out. Can you tell us about a bit about that? Well, that's interesting because I haven't really talked about it yet, so um, I'm not sure what I'm going to say here. <laughs> um, the tenth mistake of Hank Hooperman is a very, I think, compelling read, but it's also a kind of a deep read. Um, there's you know, it's about a, a kid whose mom, a 12-year-old, 11-year-old boy who takes care of his three-year-old sister, and one day his mom doesn't come home, and he, he, she's a single mom. And what do you do? What do you do? Um, and so part of it is a mystery about what happened to the mom, and part of it is, you know, trying to, this kid who's really a good kid and tries very hard to do the right thing in an almost impossible situation. Um, and so it's it, it was for me, as I, you know, it's an emotional read, but it was emotional to write it. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm hoping, I, I don't know, not that many people have read it yet. So I have no idea what people are gonna think. <laughs> also tell us about what you are writing now. Well, right now I am actually doing um, uh, the last copy edit um, of the second Dogtown book. Um, well, it's it's in my court. You know, Catherine just had it. Now it's my <laughs> in my area, um, and it is called um, it, it it is called Mouse and His Dog, and it is the point in the point of view of Mouse, who is one of the characters in Dogtown, but not the viewpoint character in the first Dogtown. And it was a hoot to write. I had so much fun doing it. Finally, it's time for Turbo 10. 10 rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Sorry. Okay, I guess so. 
Number one, what is your favorite drink, Steve? Is definitely chocolate. That's only a word, but I'll take it. Number two, what is one subject you'd love to learn more about? One subject I'd love to learn more about is um, sea turtles. Number three, what is your go-to snack food? Well, um, this isn't a food, but it's definitely cappuccino. I like cap. I mean, you know, if you want to be my friend, you give me coffee of any kind. Number four, what was your favorite book growing up? I had so many. I loved A Wrinkle in Time. I loved A Little Princess. Uh, I loved uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I loved, as I said, uh, Charlotte's Web. Uh, you know, I loved Across Five Aprils. Um, and today, I love Harry Potter. Number five, if you could teleport somewhere right now, where would you go? If I could teleport, teleport. somewhere, I would really like to go to the moon. Um, but I would like to bring people along because it looks kind of lonely there. Number six, if you could have only one superpower, what would it be? I want to fly. Absolutely. I just, I dream of flying. I can actually feel, you know, in my muscles what it was like, it's like to fly. I feel like I must have been a bird in another life. Number seven, what was your favorite cartoon as a kid? My favorite cartoon, Flintstones. <laughs> and I somehow thought I was Bam Bam. <laughs> Number eight, what is your favorite rainy day activity? Well, it's writing or reading, uh, definitely. Number nine, if you could have any three dinner guests, who would they be? If I could have three dinner guests? Uh, well. I would like definitely J.K. Rowling. Do they have to be alive? No, no, no rules. Um, I definitely would like E.B. White, uh, J.K. Rowling, and Catherine Applegate. Number 10, what is the best piece of advice you were ever given? The best piece of advice I was ever given. Oh, it was actually in an art class. Um, and uh the instructor said that your work is neither as good nor as bad as you think. You were awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. And thank you so much for spending this time with us. We can't wait to read your future books. Yeah, great questions, you guys. You were fantastic. Oh, my uh, God. Bye.